Remember, every map, every story has a focus, an angle. In science, we call it a research question because it defines where and what you do, where you go and what you do. Huh? Again, here you can see labels, and here very nicely shown with the white, that's the so, so-called halo. This is in ArcMap, not easy to find. The book shows you, I will show you. But this is really cool to break out and show. No? Makes it to read easier. Coral right. <coughs> platforms. Coral platforms. Different type of map, or maps. Color coded polygons. Let's show this in a different way. I told you, if you put it into GIS, it looks always fun. So on the left, we label that as the bad map. You see random color codes assigned to categories. You're not going to judge the categories or what kind of pattern those intervals have been taking. You can see, but there's, it ends with 185 here, 186. So it has distinct breaking points. Now, if you look just at the numbers here, it's not like 185, 185. Now, it's distinct. You know exactly 21 is to come. Yeah? Doesn't matter if you're 20.99, you're not legal drinking age. 21 and higher. Yeah? Same here. You gotta make this distinct cup. Your 21st birthday is exactly that. The night before your 21st birthday is what? It's 20.99999 something. Not making the cut, depending on the state you're in. No? The example here is why and what's going on. Hallelujah. We're going to have a map like this because the first time we track and drop data into the thing and set, select date, uh, categories, we have random assigned color maps, the uh, color uh, maps. GS calls us color maps. Huh? Doesn't make sense. Remember I said like purple, pink, or any pastel tones? This is an example of these crazy pastel tones. Yeah? You can use now monochromatic map. Same break points, same categories here. But you can see now the message is completely different. By instinct we read red as the most intense. If you look where all the red is located, and where are actually the, here the 100% uh, value, the message is different. Quick map to show my council members we did the job. Good map to show my council members we have a problem. Post poverty, yeah. For your audience, remember what's the message you want to convey to your audience. Problem, really nice allocated. Here, I give a crap. That's French for bad GIS. Huh? Almost forget we are recording this, so I gotta watch my voice. <coughs> okay. I do those PowerPoint slides when I say, I ask a question and it comes in with, well, that depends. So, Everything you do in this class and want to map out for your project, the type of map, well, that depends on your data and your idea, aka research question. No? So you got to make sure that you actually have different segments here and when you want to contrast what. No? It makes sense to have, let's say, somewhat a normalization when you want to deal with comparison of let's say population changes. Now, the normalization in this case would be percentage. You might add actually a baseline to that. No? Not going too much in depth with this, but depending on the purpose, you need to change the style of your map. In color ramps, symbolism, or symbol, symbology, not symbolism, symbology, yeah? and the message you want to convey. Choosing the wrong setup 
they tell a different story, different outcome. No? And outcome is important. Why? Results. And why more? What's more important than this? What's the next level? Information, what's the next level on that? Decision. Strategic decision. You're making based on your market analysis that is probably using visualization through a map. You're making strategic decision where to place the next $20 million investment. Or at least a plan on a napkin and then you get run the real numbers. Huh? So you've got to keep that in mind. It's not just a funny looking map. Rule number one of the many wood ones. There is no funny looking map. GIS is not funny look GIS is not a funny looking map. If you believe so, here's the door. I sign you a waiver. GIS is not a funny looking map. It tells a story. It tells a story. It conveys information to us for policy and decision making. And the reason why I'm so brutal on the funny map, funny looking map comment is of Barbara Quinn. First woman elected or appointed as a public works director in Indiana. Ever. First woman. She had no office, I think, like a Time Magazine thing. Yeah? Brutal. Knew the power of GIS when GIS was just zero and once. Yeah? Created a company that had a budget of $200,000 in the first year with savings to the community of a million because they connected the dots, literally. Water meters versus sewer data. And you found out that you actually have subdivisions consuming water but not paying sewer bills because they didn't talk to each other yet. And they added actually the taxation uh, county auditor's data to it. And boom, Cincinnati created cages. Cincinnati Area Geographic Information Systems Consortium. Big long name. Yeah? So jazz is not a funny looking man. I'm sorry, it's, it's she's right. family. So, like with that example right there, right? If you were on the other side of the table, what kind of map would you do to kind of put like a light stamp on it? Like, is there a way? Like, I'm, I'm saying like- To lie with a map? Huh? To lie with a map? Not, not lie, but like, like the example that you gave uh, the first week, kind of how you can manipulate the data. Not manipulate it, but you can kind of tell two stories. Okay, okay. With like different All right, points. Yeah, let's, let's go through this. Right. Um, what do you see here? Not really lying, but it's distorting a little bit the information. All right, he is getting it. He is getting the short acronym read up. So this is California County's population of 2007. Do we care right now how this is broken down? Probably not. This is, I think it was natural chains, natural breaks. Yeah. So it's one of the categories that automatically is assigned when you load data. No gerrymandering in California is removed. It's the only state. Stay focused, stay focused. <laughs> All right, counties, population 2007. Where is, yes. <laughs> where is LA? <clears throat> Down here, is it? Yeah? What county is that? <laughs> yeah? What do we have down here in that area? San Diego. What do we have here? San Francisco. So we got our pointers a little bit. Uh, Redlands, California is, I think, here or there. The bike is here, right there. That, in that area. <laughs> All right. Stay focused. So when I read this right now, these counties here look darn populated. Huh? Mm -hmm. Highest counts right now, highest categories are uh, Okay, please cash. Stay focused. I'm happy to make jokes in between and uh, tell stories to get you a little bit uh, lighten up, uh, but stay focused. So all this area is highly populated, is it? What do I show right now here? I show the population, population count and my geographic unit is county. In the county. 
Is all population equally distributed over a county? No. 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 All right. Well, that's one way to map something. Or I use graduated point markers. So I'm running actually through the different types of marking and showing. Uh, these point markers right now show the location of the county center point, not the population center. But if I look at that, I could say, well, yeah, LA, I get it. And San Diego, I get it. And San Diego is far out, uh, stretches into its hinterlands too. Yeah. But yeah, then I don't know really what town is that, but that looks really big. San Bernardino. Yeah? Oh, is San Bernardino really located at that dot? Not really, because it's the center point of your county. If you look carefully, this is a per almost a perfect uh, uh, square. It's in the middle. We call it center point or centroid, because all the information you put in has to have a reference. Even the labels and the symbols need to have a reference. That's the reason why we call them markers and the point associated. So address point, and then you have the marker to show the address. Yeah. So this is like we did with population in the Pennsylvania example, or the truck homes, you know, truck houses. It's not really helpful. We can see a little bit of agglomeration here, and this is stretching out. Different way, we could use fish net, as an example from the textbook. Huh? And say, well, we take the fishnet and put it as an overlay of all the counties, and then say, tell each square in here, pick the number from the county. So you would create, oh, did nothing do that. You would create basically a fishnet in the shape, show different color settings, like you see that in the shades. Now, Depending on the purpose you want to map and the story you want to tell, Charles, this is different now. This is now population density. This is still not showing where population lives in that county, but it takes into account what? Population per square mile. Square mile per square. Value over area. Whatever value and area measurement you want to have. Huh? Could be income, doesn't make sense, income density. But could be an interesting measure if you want to be creative. You know? So here you see the population density for 2007 on square miles. <coughs> makes sense because you want to show the whole state. And now you realize that guy who was number one before is just mediocre mid middle field. Yeah? We have a little bit of tension here, but those guys showed earlier, he stayed a little bit the same, but all this sector here, that whole area, now is very distinct in where is my population located by its density. I could go more extreme and map out, if I would have a little bit more information, I could map out the housing units per square mile and separate them between rental and ownership or apartments versus single family and would get different perspectives. Again, good point. Depending on what the purpose is you have to want to, or you want to convey, you can present this in different measures. That's actually super easy to calculate because if your system is set up the right way, you will have the square miles or square footage of that county in your database. Moving that in a week, two weeks, you're moving from layers as a shape file into actually feature classes that are in a database. A little container that helps us to work more efficient. Yeah? And the database will calculate all these areas for us automatically. Yeah? So what you basically do is you add a field into a, a table and you basically say population 2007 which was provided area is given calculate that equals populations over area boom done that map takes longer to fit the colors than to calculate that value believe it or not it's like we'll, almost like an excel spreadsheet click click track talk all right 
What else do we have? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Remember, a dot on a map does not necessarily mean that's the location of your measurement. These dots are not population centers as cities. This is using this feature called pop dot density. It's in chapter two. Huh? If you haven't done it, just read carefully through it. Find dot density as the function in the uh, toolbox, in the software, and read the help function. I cannot stress it out. The help function of the last five years changed completely. It tells you what it does with pictures and really smart explanations, not cryptic, academic, researchy thing. Huh? Like you don't have to be a GIS geek now to do GIS. It's fairly easy to understand. What do you need to understand here? That dot in the legend is not the city location. Dot density takes an area of interest, let's say in this county, takes the value of 2007, figures out I have X amount of people living there divided by 50,000 and place randomly, randomly, those dots in that specific county area. Like you would take a bunch of coins and throw them up and where they fall on the ground randomly locate and then you make sure that they're actually the same amount that you actually here have here yeah? so that doesn't mean that they're all living at this location or that location yeah? this is a random location inside that polygon here associated with about 50,000 people okay brief remember randomly assigned location to represent 50,000 people in that given area, <coughs> not a city. Because if you see a map like this, like, yeah, that city has 50,000 people. No, it's not. Really cool tool if you want to show density in a different way, rather than with uh, color settings like this. Yeah? If you want to create a very complicated thinking pattern, you can use that. I use this actually the other way around. I use this for data mining. If I have underlying data, like elevation data, and I would like to know how tall is a specific building, and I have no other information but the footprint of the building. Because what we, you will learn is we can actually go with like aerial photography, like Google Earth, you can look on top of a building and draw these boundaries and say, this is my footprint. It's easy, you're going to do that for this building or the college. Yeah? Look at the campus map and just put points together as a polygon and say, this is our building footprint. Yeah? The height of the building is unknown, but I have data that shows me terrain or other information of height so I could go in and say, I take all these points, let's say 20 points, have each point drilled down and tell me 10 feet, 12 feet, and I take the average and then I have, have an example of how that block building would look like. Yeah? That's how industry does this. It's called LIDAR. Yeah? Um, light and detection range, like literally you shoot a laser beam and count how fast the laser beam is returned on leaves, on infrastructure, streets, etc., buildings, and you can create that. And if you don't have complex computer software to do LiDAR data, you take a LiDAR um, a layer and fake the, um, or simplify this with dot density. It's actually a really cool, cool method. Uh, can you send me an email? Remind me one envelope, remind me next week, preferable like Wednesday so I can pull this out of the archive. I did the whole downtown based on LiDAR data and exploded that. So you guys can see that just at least one slide on animation. Huh? What do you call it? Light, uh, uh, just say uh, random dots, building heights. That's the keyword. <coughs> okay, numeric scales. We're going, I'm going to run through this so we have more time. And we are moving from lots of lecture into more and more applied. Promise. Yeah? 
This is probably the longest lecture you will have in this class. So don't fall asleep right now. Mm -hmm. Not yet. But same thing here, numeric scales. We talk a lot about the visualization by coloring. Well, you gotta have categories or groupings or intervals assigned to then associate a specific color codes to it. Huh? That's the dirty secret of mapping. You discriminate, draw a line in between and value numbers, and then you say, this is white, this is black, or 50 shades of gray. Huh? Um, so the breakpoints is important. There are different ways to do these breakpoints. Huh? Rule of thumb, you could keep them equal, like here, or increase them by specific intervals with. Huh? There are different ways to do this. If you don't do it by industry standards because your boss tells you you need to do that, there are certainly some gut feelings to it. And one of the assignments, uh, actually this one, is going to ask you do equal intervals for $10,000 steps. I think this is this one. Yeah? Well, that's easy. I know exactly, okay, my interval size is 10,000. Sometimes you may have to make a decision depending on your mapping purpose. We had a student who was interested in this interested in workforce housing. Well, for that, you need to know what's the poverty line and the typical income levels here in the county. Maybe you want to map out income levels and show that which areas in that county and households in that county do not have above poverty line income. You know? So you draw that as a, a distinct value. You know? And there are different e examples. So you could double, you can do equal interval breaks, you can use exponential or geometric breaks, but find, it doesn't matter which one you use in the beginning, find one that you can justify part of the assignment. I will actually ask you for pick one and make a justification why you chose that. Huh? Right. Think about that. Lying with maps. This is a great danger to lie easily because you choose the wrong way. But make an informed decision which one you want to choose. I'd rather have you map three times with the wrong scale, but you have an equal comparison between the three data sets, then you smooth uh, mismatch the representation of your data and therefore biased info great biased information. Yeah? Alright, we're going through this very quickly because I want to show you that on the screen. Equal intervals, mentioned it earlier, yeah. Here instead of ten thousand you have one hundred blocks, not so good for highly peak or school data distributions. That's statistics. Yeah? <laughs> statistics. We're getting there. One thing you need to look at is the data you actually have inside in your data sets. Huh? Never trust data you did not create. Always check in the tool called Art Catalog. Always investigate your data before you get there. Before you put it in the map, investigate. Why? Because the, value, the table could not be populated or the data is wrong. Population data, which is one, 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 doesn't make sense. So something went wrong. But that's the nature of breaks. We did this, I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that's two chairs. I'll show you that uh, on the other screen. Because this is pretty much done. Did you ever send an email with the uh, class uh, PowerPoint that you had for LAN? LAN Not site? yet, because I will post them on Blackboard. Alright, five more minutes and then we can take. This is trying to calm you down. Huh? Because like ooh, we're going to use chairs. Like last time we only had like 45 minutes on it. I call it we did bad things in the past. And this is about five years, six years old PowerPoint. I haven't added more things to it, but I can add more things because I've done bad things since then. Um, in mapping. Examples that she has is a learning process. 
Yeah? I want you to understand that the guy who's teaching this class with 20 something years in a cartography and ma uh, mapping software yeah? started out the same way you guys did. Well, a little bit different, but the same way. There was a computer, open up the computer, find the software, double click it, open it up. Yeah? My first RTS was 3.x. I mentioned that I think last week. Yeah? So I'm, an, I'm a grandpa in the business. Yeah? I met people who built GS before S3 actually came up with that. That's cool. Like really cool guys. What you see right now here is you would think this is a map. Yeah? It's an isochronous line which shows in German the location of interest, the Autobahn. Yeah? And you can see here, it looks like rain, but this is actually drive time. Okay? This was sketched with a mouse in PowerPoint. Because I did not know or didn't want to do a GS example, just produce that pictogram to visualize what is actually my master thesis about. No? Versa, master thesis. No? <clears throat> this is an example for the Cincinnati Public Schools we did in grad school, a colleague of mine did, and this is where directions just started to be included into GIS, and you actually can see the routing between, I think, schools and fire hydrants or hospitals, what is it? A facility, school routes, see that screenshot doesn't even tell you fire hydrants, yeah, fire hydrants. Yeah. So if that is the school of interest, these are actually fire hydrant locations. Yeah? That's the school of interest. Um, doesn't make sense. Completely cluttered, completely full of information that you didn't need. You see a radial buffer around that as drive time. Um, imagination, basically saying, okay, with certain, in certain distances. Yeah? Uh, the drive time I showed you as a sketch, that's the really cool stuff we're doing in this class later. Yes, What are the black dots? Can't remember, it's a screenshot, so you would have to move this up. Um, don't really know. It's just an example of a bad map. <clears throat> we could look this up, there's a Central Parkway, we could look up, course, that's downtown, East Coast Street. Um, this is where Kroger's and Chiquita is located, and Procter and Gamble is down here. Yeah? But it doesn't matter. It's just, it's completely, completely full of cluster stuff. This is work in process, a screenshot from something work. Yeah? Something you do right now for work. This is not your final product. But that student did take a screenshot and put it out. The reason why I do this is because I was part of the team. Yeah? So not really great. Back then, all right, not too bad ones. <clears throat> this is work on GIS with spatial analysts. You can see here the topography, you see water bodies, population, residential neighborhoods, and this is actually finding a new school site using special tools for a new street. Yeah? Close up, so not too bad because it actually shows where the close up down here is located. This is a zoom in has different land use, well, could do a little bit better, um, get rid of the legend. Not a bad one. Yeah? This was an independent project for GIS class. That's a bottle, that's a beer class in the background. That's the most common asked question by students. That was a poster I did years ago. Criticize what you see, what you hate. Come on, guys. <laughs> what's, what's cool in this? What's not so great? The black background. Make it white better. The white font. All right. This, if you look there, the conference is higher. This was actually on a large poster scale, really nice to read because it was really big. Huh? But okay, could have been better. Right? More gray scale, more more dull for the background of the bottle. No. What else? What is great? I'm not fishing for compliments, but at least you can say something. 
I am. You're laughing. Is this, is this your own? Uh, I did this. This is. I'm just sending my work here. It is beautiful. This is <laughs> 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 That's funny. I might buy you a cheap off at graduation. <laughs> All right, this is cool. Yeah. Huh? This is cool. This is Hamilton County, Ohio, Cincinnati. This is the location. The location of that neighborhood, even like the soup out uh, um, lines, yeah. So, zoop, uh, the enterprise is flying by. You can see an overview here, not so great, but you get a feel what's going on, explains what's going on here with text, uh, crime density. And then, the really cool part is with very little effort, you actually can do the whole county into a 3D mapping and a 3D raster, and you elevate that. You don't. You don't think that putting. I know that you said that. No, but don't you think that putting like a border around the map uh, creates? Uh, for example, it's a white background, and it just so happens that the areas that are light are towards the edges. Therefore, blending kind of the map. With the white. Yeah, but you have a, this kind of full background here a little bit, so you create this Contract. offset. Yeah. I'm thinking about the inbox. A yeah. year. Yeah. No, that's perfectly fine. You, you can see, okay, this is the overview. Yeah. No, this is no, purple. No, 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 you can see the, the, the yellow one. On the yellow one. Yeah, yeah, on the right. Yeah, yeah, on the right. Like that one, yeah. That, that one too. So, so it's a white background and the edges and it just happens to be light yellow. So it's kind of hard to yeah, see. Yeah, it's brutally detailed here. That's okay. also, okay. you gotta, gotta okay. don't forget that if you have a thousand DPI, let's say up like our numbers, uh, two, uh, 72 DPI is usually a screen. This is dot per inch poor. Okay. So if you would look at this, this is like then very distinct. Okay. Yeah? When the black box here in the middle is not as distinct, but you, you can see this. Okay, color ramps, color schema, good point. The green or blue or red would be more contrast. Right. Yeah? It's a little bit, little bit mellow here. What else? Well, these are screenshots, yeah? And someone didn't care about taking parts of the other overlapping image uh, windows, yeah? So if you do screenshots for work like this, please make sure that the other windows in your screen are not part of your project. This is, I think this is the bad part of this. Everything else I found okay. It explains actually what happened here. Yeah, The whole project was a massive pain, but this stuff, this gives me shivers. Yeah? Uh, These could be larger. That's what I'm saying. Yeah? Um, but this was like an internal poster competition within a class. So you did this for 11 weeks and then you had like 10 posters and everyone was presenting that on my poster, and then you, this was live data. So all these sliders here would be assumptions you would move, and the map would recalculate on the fly. Depending on the algorithms, on the fly would mean half an hour. Uh, so that's reason also, live demos. At the end of this class, we're doing presentations. Run, uh, in a few weeks. Run your presentation and your work multiple times before that. Because some students might choose the online portal, some students just do, let's say, PowerPoint. Be aware if you show something you have done to explain your progress, uh, process, that that calculation might take a moment. If it takes more than just a moment, like come back in 20 minutes after a cup of coffee, don't do the live demo. Jump over that step and do like two screenshots in a PowerPoint or separate documents. Yeah? Don't waste time in a life, with a live demo. All calculations have been done. Present the results. Process and results, but don't do the process like we do in class. I click here and wait a little bit, click here and wait a little bit, don't. Yeah? All right, next one. Ooh, <clears throat> that's Michael's work. So I have a very, very dear friend. Uh, who lives and works in the Bahamas. Um, <clears throat> he is actually the assistant director of the antiques and museums in the Bahamas, does lots of historic stuff. 
wreck diving, blue holes, and permits, and all that. Really cool job. Um, skeletons and indigenous island population. Really cool work. This is one of his darkest hours. Um, <laughs> He did a suitability analysis, which means you create index here and index there, you overlap your calculated numbers, and based on that composite index, you give a recommendation. So what he did is the locations in the county, yeah, created slope, like mountain stuff, hill stuff, created soil drainage. Yeah. This is more coming from the Ge geography world, anthropology geography world, and environmental stuff, and then created here the distance from a river. Cool colors, huh? Mm -hmm. huh? Father of three, so a lot of crayon work. Um, with, in meters, with different distances, I think 500,000, 1,500, and 2,000. That's fine, you can calculate that uh, about 1,500 meters is just short of mine. Yeah? Um, did all this, put it together, and created a suitability or probability map. I can't remember exactly what it was. It was something about allocation of certain settlements, etc., and environmental risk. Yeah? He did both. So you can see again, legend tells you, okay, the light blue is the river, Ohio River, North Arrow Creek, 12 miles, not so great, didn't really speak. Who was that with the uh, skipper? Yeah? Takes you 30 seconds to make the adjustment. Get full points. Huh? <clears throat> Not enough data. It's blank. Would be great to actually if you use outlines here, or you actually didn't use outlines here. Would be used actually to say, nice to say, okay, not enough data is actually a square. Some outline that you have see, okay. But understand that he had a dedicated symbol here we can't see it here. for this versus. Did he miss it? Or is it on purpose? Yeah. Then it says low, high, and medium. First of all, it should be low, medium, high, increasing scale. Yeah. And low, high, medium, well, if you don't know what he was looking for, medium might be actually the stuff he wants to do. Because remember, there's slope in it. Yeah. So, no idea about his research, no idea about the result, how to read this. It doesn't say anything. That's the reason why it's an example of a bad map. No story told. Huh? Very bad ones. Like really bad ones. This example doesn't really work well in Florida because you might recognize the names on this. What do you see right now? It's a map. What else? I islands. Oh, the Bahamas. Yeah. Typically, you would put islands into like a blue background, no? To see, to give an estimation of water. Yeah. I can't remember what other, what we did with the dots, but yeah, those are the Bahamas. For a guy who was born and raised in the Bahamas, that's a bad representation of your home area. So, <laughs> all right. But hey, this is me. Apologize for the German in it. Um, this is the city of Nuremberg. Uh, Munich is down here, and Berlin is on the second floor. Uh, this is where I went to college in Bayreuth. Remember when I told you pie charts are bad? This is one reason. Looking at this. You see a bunch of pie charts that are actually giving you the customer breakdown of the today's visit of the customer alone with a partner, with the family, or with just friends. Yeah. Technically, color ramp here is okay. You want to have the single customer or the team. So you can see, okay, there's a bunch of people. This is by zip code, but the map here right now on the display <coughs> Better here. Doesn't really show, you can mine uh, gray lines, you can see. Those are the German zip code areas in the center points again. The city here overlaps like hell. That's a French word for don't do it. No? And then you can see the isochronous lines here in dark blue for 60 minutes. 
and you can see the interstates or autobahns going on. And you see that. So basically, what you see right now here is six or seven maps in one. Final product master thesis. That is a very bad map. <laughs> Yourself, you're great. Uh, I, got, I, I got, I got, my, I got my degree with distinction, but distinction and a slap in the face by the guy who created this one. But um, yeah, really bad. So here's the fun part: novel concept, isochronous lines, drive time. There was no script that mouse click two times and you get this, like we do in two or three weeks. You know? Also, like weeks of programming work. But all these pie charts could be a different map because now I'm combining two or three different messages in one. If you, you, and you start talking different things, we in the room do not understand one word. Now, the Bible talks about the word, was it Babel? Babylon? Babel? Where everyone is talking a different tongue? Yeah. That is speaking different tongue. Uh, give you a close up, oh, uh, close up, close up example. This is nice, you know. Kilometers of scale, but you can see here it's completely off the charts. Yeah? Um, don't do that. Only good thing is, I redid the map for location down down here as a consulting job, and that paid for the airfare to come to the U.S. Man, I was cheap. They didn't hire me. They used my technique, my master thesis, actually to hire someone else. Yeah, well, that's okay. I came to the U.S. and now I'm here. Sorry, guys. I'm here. <laughs> All right. City government produced map. Remember what I told you. When you pull in data, it randomly assigns color ramps or color settings. Yeah, this is randomly assigned. Typically, like IN is industrial in this case, existing land use, existing land use code. Yeah. Technically, you would try to use yellows for, uh, for residential codes, single family. No? That was an officially produced local government map. And the, uh, somewhere in Cincinnati, because that is Cincinnati coding. No? Not cool. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the decluttered version of isochronous lines, but again, could have dropped all the color codes of the zip codes to show where people are coming from. <coughs> yeah? Remember, this is, this is my Pennsylvania example. Counties versus cities, show what's important, take another space. Most students' reports, if they do include mapping, fail or get this. Uh, less points because you want to crunch everything into one. Big lessons learned in this class is going to be to decide, oh, I'm going to open up a different arc map and I'm going to do a separate project. Or within the same project, I'm doing two different maps in two different arc map windows. And you can copy and paste actually data over so you don't have to redo the same work all the time. Yeah? So, that point to make the decision, I'm changing my workflow, I'm running this in two different uh, windows instead of one. It helps a lot to produce a clear, precise message and map. All right, same thing here, same thing here. Yeah, this is the example I paid for flying here. Yeah? More distinct, 60 minutes drive time, could do a different one. Yeah? Paid for the effort. Freight, freight flows in the uh, traffic systems in the US, rail years ago, very lots of information could be cleaner. <coughs> First thing I would do is I would actually drop the um, beige tone in the states. And I'll make the state boundaries more distinct, but this. I can skip this from Mike. Um, here, he used different projections. You can see this in the curving from the uh, United States. These are rectified. This not. Yeah? So you mixed up your orientations. Um, that's mic two. Ooh, yeah. This is a cool map. 
this is still a not, a not a good example, right? This is, no, this is actually a good one. Um, if you want to go wee nuts with GIS, you could, we could do some, cheap, some statistics. This is actually here. Remember when we talk about distribution, like normal distribution, bell curve? <coughs> Everyone knows curves because you want curve grades. Yeah? This is actually showing a spatial distribution of a population. This is actually um, ethnicity, I think by gangs. Yeah? And you can see how they are populated in their statistical terms. Not dots on a map, but no, this is an overlap of the statistics on top of that. That's really cool stuff um, where you can actually say this is actually the spatial extension, the direction of that statistics. So think about there are hundreds of points underneath it and they calculated that on top of that. And you can see that this is more wider and this, is, um, this one is more dense. You can set one or two standard deviations. So think about the craziness of statistics put in space. And now we can make predictions what's going to happen here in that overlapping area or in that overlapping area if you deal with gangs and gangs turf. Yeah. Folks who did that wrote that software for ESRI and they also made some really good news in I think it was Norway of uh, picket pocketing um, gangs. But literally they would walk in through uh, tourism, uh, tourist areas and start picking wallets. Leg, uh, but not always at the same time and same pattern. Using this technique actually helped to identify what could be the next area. Uh, and then, if you have time, um, still available, I think, as a used book, How to Live with Maps. Jarvis, this is a must read. If you want to know how to do things wrong, this is really good stuff. You want to know somebody's trying to bear and bamboozle. Huh? Bamboozle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. right. Let's do literally a three minute break and then we run everything in here as we can do. if you would use the online. Oh, you have done that before. I mean it, guys. Take a walk. Stretch those legs. Just a, just a minute walk helps to put more energy in your brain again. Working these computers, we don't need the code, right? But don't come in on a Friday evening to get your assignment done, because it's due at 8 p.m. Come in on a Tuesday. 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 What time to what time? Four till six. Four till eight. Four, four till eight. 
And in theory, the library, I think, is closing at 8 or 10. So mm -hmm. if you do overtime, fine. But I would not recommend to do stuff like this on Fridays. Start on a Tuesday. Make sure that you have maybe Thursday or Friday to cover up. If you depend on these computers. Thursday is available. Two. Six till eight. So the syllabus. Okay. Right. Guys, start this. Come on. No, no parking tickets. Then we call. Nope. You gotta leave early then. Uh, okay. Are they open today? Until twelve. Oh, then, then you leave early. But I will not. I cannot close class okay. before for that. Hmm? You guys are ready. Yes. Okay, we're going to log in to our setups. I'm going to change to the room PC. Do I need to jump some data. What we're going to do is we do a quick review and run very fast through open up our catalog, open up our map, take a look at the data, add data to our mapping project and then we work our way through. Okay? So one thing I want to check is if you are at the same location than last time, it might have remembered certain settings. This one here does remember certain settings. Yeah? You also remember we did download data. So if I go to downloads, I can see my prior folder called the Broward County GIS data. Everyone sees that? Are you still sitting at the old machine? No. It's gone. All right, let's create this from scratch then. So I'm going to rename this, or to put this in archive. Did you have move it from downloads to somewhere? No, it should be in downloads because we did not move it at all. Okay, yeah, it's empty. I did not move it. Uh, what, maybe you have it in your own documents. It should be safe in your no, no. Right. I will run this again for downloads. If you want to save it somewhere later after this, it's fine. Jump drive, local networks, etc. Yeah? 
So how do we get this data? Well, it was we got this from Blackboard. So I open up Chrome. And find Blackboard. In my case, that is down here. Or you type in sharklearn.nova.edu. Log in with your uh, code. Fingers crossed. Right password. Yeah. And we go to GIS. You might see a different setup here. Go to GIS. I switch this to Student View. And we go to my, my course content and take a look at the GIS data. Come on, guys, we're doing, doing the fun stuff. Three minutes plus plus plus. Huh? All right, in my course content, you can see a bunch of things like the syllabus, blah blah, the how to install the ArcGIS. If you want to install this on your personal machine, and we have down here, the um, this is the GIS tutorial that I mentioned earlier. This is your uh, Allegheny County Pittsburgh stuff. And we see here data for session one. We're going to reuse this. Yes? Um, I can't log out of somebody else's session. How do I do that? Sorry. All right. On Back the bottom the left on your screen, you log out of somebody else's. It doesn't give the option. Yeah. All right. On bottom screen. Bottom screen. <coughs> why, is, why is Ed sitting here? Didn't you lock in yet? No. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can I just restart it? Came back at the same Let's restart again. And it works because you find another one. Yeah. Actually, uh, just jump. This one, that one doesn't work because I already had to move from this one this okay. morning. Yeah. For the same reason. Same reason? Okay. Mm -hmm. Is the one next to you? Can you log in on these? Do they show other users? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, this one works. So if you have issues in logging in, um, if you just click the cursor keys, you should see someone else's name. But on the bottom left, you should see other user. If you click other user, it will ask you for your login credentials, okay? If I use the word credentials, it means for the system you log in, that would be username and password. For the ArcGIS online world, that stuff in the cloud, your credentials, I send you the email with that. Login name and your password you assigned yourself. So if an assignment later on will say, using these credentials, it's your login accounts. Okay? Just to clarify that term. Alright. In the data for the first session, we are going to click on the BC GS data set. So down you might actually have it or on the jump drive or at the computer you used the last time in the downloads. So we have this download. Very fast and very slow. <laughs> and then we're going to extract that. On the computers in this classroom, there's a tool called Win7, Win7 or something like this. So this reason why it's a little bit different. I'll show you this in a second. So if I click on this one here on the side and say open. It comes up with this tool. Yeah. Is it? Uh, go to Angela. Go to Blackboard. Log in. You go see to the GIS data. Is it right? Yep. Yeah. And then extract. Uh, I click on this and click on the minus sign. Say extract. And for me, because I get this out, I'm Let's going see. to extract that into my downloads folder. You can extract that to any other location. To make following easier, please use downloads right now. We, this is a step we're going to repeat multiple times with different data. So the workflow is important. Download, extract, allocate. And click OK. So a few seconds later. So 
I'm copying it to the, the jump drive, right? Yep. And then we open from the from the jump drive. Mm, wait a moment. Okay. Yeah. So whenever whatever I do now in my downloads folder, you will do in your jump drive. Okay. Whatever folder you have assigned. Okay. I just file. Okay. Ready? Everyone has the file. Yeah. All right. Let's close a little bit here. Stuff. Get the clean overview. So if I look now in my downloads, I see the SIP archive and I see a folder. For those who have been here last week, as a repeat, if I look into the, in the um, uh, File Explorer in Windows, I see a bunch of files here. In my arc catalog, I will only see one, okay? Let's open arc, up arc catalog. Going down here to ArcGIS, open up Arc Catalog. And you figured out by now that we'd, what we've done last week in 40 minutes, we're doing like in three to four. Huh? So click, 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 set up. Arc Catalog. Catalog. Takes a moment. Following steps I'm going to do. On my machine, I'm going to kill all my folder connections. Yeah? Clean sweep. So I can show you how to do this again. Yeah? I do a clean sweep, and then what we will do is I will connect my catalog to my downloads folder as my workspace. That's a specific tool we're going to use for that. Yeah? Super easy. And then we're going to build our project and work through. Right, see these folder connections here? I'm going to kill those with right click, disconnect. Clean sweep. Okay. If you haven't looked, logged in on the computer yet, okay. you didn't remember your settings, this is what you should see right now. Nothing. All right. Everyone has the data unzipped. Everyone has our catalog open. All right. Who has folder connections right now? Perfect. Let's repeat that step again. How would I add folder connections? Box. That plus. Box with the plus. Yeah, there are different ways to do this, but this is usually the easy way. Connect to folder, and in the disaster called computer, we find the location we want to connect to. In this case, I want to use downloads. Just like this, don't go <coughs> deeper. Yeah, just that. That's the tool I want to splash in. And I have this. Yeah? You do that one more time. Yeah. The zip doesn't show up. Okay, I do it again. Disconnect. Folder connections. Connect to a folder. My username, downloads. All right. In a normal computer at home, if you don't have that WinZip tool included, that would not show up in our catalog. So computers here are messing with your mind, with your sen. Huh? You only will see archive and VCGS data in my case, or in your case only VCGS data plus that archive. You don't want to use that. Right now, just top level downloads. Everything else of the computer we don't, we are not interested in. Just the downloads are there. There you go. How are you holding up? You're cool? Uh, so I activate that and it pops up here. Yeah? So, the assignment will ask you, create a project folder called A1 and then your end number. Well, let's create that step. In our catalog, we can create folders. So in my area here, in my workspace right now, what I'm going to do is I right click, say new, and I get a ton of functions. One of the functions is folder. Can you see that? I got top. I, uh, yeah. I was not able to connect my uh, data. Sure. Click here on the plus. On the drive. Click on your drive. Yep. Okay. This is the zip. You have to use the extract part. Just keep the drive. Keep the drive and hit OK. I do keep the drive. The drive. Okay. Top level. Take the drive. Right there? Yep. And hit OK. So now click here and open up. Do you see your data? Yeah, there's some space on the right there. Yep. No, it's actually an access machine, is it? No. 
Did you ex did you extract your data, your zip file? I thought I did. Okay, everyone cl clicks on that folder, and then, it, like in Windows Explorer, you see that you can create a folder. Let's name it A. Right here, right? A one. Yeah, but it's. Um, Is E you really E? Yeah. And you need to jump drive. A1 and You're in the middle. You're in the middle. A1 and you're in the middle. So you're like, oh, no, this is a compressed folder. Oh, we got an extraction. So, let's see. I'm going to Refresh. You see this already. Now it's coming in. So it's just had to refresh. All right. Yeah. 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 For the exam, for the assignment, so not to confuse you guys, we're using this call, we're calling this 8x. Yeah? So, capital A. Uh, capital A, X, underscore, and your N number. Just a number. I do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If the number is yeah? You could do the actual number for training purposes. I just type in the six first numbers here, uh, random numbers. The important part is that you just got demonstrated how to create a folder in Art Catalog and rename it or name it properly. If you, like, like I did, have an issue to um, trigger finger the enter key, right click on it, rename. And you can type in what you want. Yes, so we don't have the, the BCGIS data folder. You should. Have you pressed F5 to refresh it or right click and refresh it? Once you connect to the folder, you should refresh it. Because you connected to the BCGIS folder, you did not connect to the downloads. You are one level too deep. So to fix this, yes. you can disconnect this one. Connect. If you connect the folder, only connect to downloads. Because if you connect to BCGS data, you will not see that folder in the overview. Always use the upper level. Huh? Only connect to downloads to this example. All right, let's run this. It's exciting. So you just learn again how to do a folder and even rename the folder here. Now I'm going to show you how to copy data with our catalog. 
because from now on you never ever will copy data in, into uh, with, uh, file explorer but extract or zip no copies of this stuff here no copies of these by hand yeah. huge troublemaker huh titanic meets the hindenburg don't want to do that only in here so how would we do this well if you want to deal with the data here and here i want to copy everything now in my assignment folder i can do this in a different way i could now take the whole vcgs data right click on it and use copy don't do it go. just show or i can go down here take the big roads man once and the census block once right click on it do copy go up to my ax folder and right click and say paste and now i can see big roads just the big roads got copied over Okay, let's do this again with the census blocks. So we do, do we do that. That's the way you do that. A full folder or each single uh, layer or shape file, those eight SHPs. Left click to highlight, right click to copy, and then I highlight the folder where I want to copy it into, my destination folder. And right click and do paste. Can we also do control C, control V? Yes. Okay. So in theory, can I also do a drag and drop in theory, but that's actually moved in this case. You want the big words over the end? Yeah. Sounds all messed up. Again, this guy is acting a different way like your Windows Explorer. He said not to do that. You can use Control Z and Control V. That is Charlie and Victor. Huh? She was laughing. Chelsea, Chelsea, that is comment about the Z. In the Z. Control C and Control V works in the catalog as well. All right. So now you prepare all your spatial data in your project folder, huh? aka hypothetically as an assignment. Now we take a look at what kind of data do we have. We do this with the census plot data. Remember, we have the content tab, we have preview tab, and we have descriptions. In the preview, whenever it pops up, it shows that we have this our spatial extent, all the crazy block groups. Looks okay to me. Lessons learned number one. If I move into that window, I see at the bottom right some numbers and units, decimal degrees. That gives me an idea what kind of playground this is going to be. Baseball field or football field. Could be decimal degrees, which is a worldwide geographic network for projection, or could be in feet. Typically, if it's in feet, it's localized. Someone made that data for you. This is global stuff. I can put with that data from Africa together if it's the same way. Yeah? <coughs> so bottom right gives you an indication of what nature of your data you're dealing with. This will come in the next few weeks, but it's part important to know. On the bottom left, we'll see other information popping up later. Okay? Okay, let's change to the table. How do we change to the table? If I want to look inside, I'm going to select geography. So this is like looking at like bio glass, like see through into your data. Here I have valuable information already. I can see what type of data I have. I can see what kind of fields inside are included. We looked at this last time, this is the amount of lands and the amount of water. So we're playing with the lands in a minute. I also can see how many items I have in this data table. <coughs> right now, I do trust at almost 22,000 points. 
of items. Yeah? Sometimes you see of 2,000 only. 2,000 because the review is doing that just there. I can also click here to move to the end of the table and I see how many features or items I have in the table. This is before I started this whole project with opening up a map. I already know what type of fields I have, what type of amount of items I have in my data. Huh? So if I would ask you how many features does your data contain, that is one way to do. Huh? Super simple. Tom, yep. a question. How did we get that data to begin with? I you downloaded it from Broward County GIS and gave it to you. I, I, I know. So right now, your professor gave you the data. Okay, I, I understand, but how do we do it ourselves? Go into Broward County and... Next week. Next week. Right. Today is a little bit too tight. All right. I told you too many stories. Good. So 21,000 features, right? 21,811 would be the answer for that question. In that case, yeah? Like if there's, like looking at the data block of data set of the uh, census blocks 2010 provided in your assignment, how many features do you have? That's the way you do this, all right? Simply exploring your data. Now I can trust the data. If I want to map out the amount of lands, I have simply checked with this, scrolling up and down, that I pretty much have the amount of lands field populated. Huh? So I know, okay, it's not this, it's this. So I can use this. So if my map shows up blank, I know I'm doing something wrong because I have actually data here. Important thing. It's like you walk into a library and you think you're in the wrong room because there are no books. Right now you know that there are books. Yeah? So think about this. Use our catalog to manage and maneuver around with your data. But one new thing, let's open up Chrome again. And we're going to ArcGIS.com. Has to be Chrome. ArcGIS.com. No login required. Huh? We do the login stuff next week for time purposes. <coughs> okay? I go to Galleria, and the reason why I'm going to do this right now, I am looking for a so-called base map. I want to show the data I've been playing with, I want to show that with context. Could be a street map, could be a topography map, anything we can find here. To make this easy, I don't want to have five years of drought, yeah? I want to look for base maps. Industry term, so the industry gives you actually the ideas. Yeah? I want to use S3 base maps to be more clean. And now you can see that it's even funny stuff like the children's map and all that. And other examples. You could use terrain with labels, topography. There is a street map. You could also search for this. Yeah? Let's just click through it. It comes usually here, navigation, streets, we literally have to go a little bit further because sometimes the streets do not work. They are not our friends. Huh? All right, listen carefully. I am moving, I found the streets here. This example is my page three. could be somewhere else. For you. I go over there and in my Chrome right now, it should actually pop up here. I click, should, if you move over there, it should pop up. I clicked here on streets on the bottom, do not click into the map. And it popped up this one. Do not click open. If you click open, it pops up into a web browser and does online br uh, mapping with you. That's um, the thing we don't want. From Esri Maps, I'm sorry, from Esri Base Maps, I get a different... Uh, Overview? Do you get a different view? Yeah. yeah. All right. Than, than yours. But street? Like, I don't have streets. Right. All right. Yeah. Let's do this the other way. Ne next. Okay. Do the next base maps. Button. Search. Yeah? It's, yeah? it's on page three. When I say streets in the search, 
on page three. On page three. Hit enter, and now I search it through it, and you get different uh, okay. street, uh, right. different ideas here too. Okay. Some sometimes not might not work. Let's do this here. Streets. See if you click here, it says map viewer. You don't want that. I want to click on this guy. Exactly, this is the map viewer. I got to do this uh, for demo. I will do this in the, in the other view. So page three. Change together. Now it's page four. It's actually most recent, not popular. Because I mean, yeah, the S3 page maps helps you. You can do this with other elements as well. Imagery, WGS, 84 is also my preferred one. So that works where you want to actually have aerial photography. We will do different ones. Huh? I click on this one here on the streets. Do not click on open. Move over and click on a little arrow. Because then it tells you open in map viewer or in ArcGIS desktop. Yes, we want it open in ArcGIS desktop. And click OK. Yeah. So in my case, this browser doesn't like GIS. So I just downloaded some funky name file. Yeah? What I do is I open it. You can do this with double clicking and hoping it works. Or you say open on the side on the button. If it works, it will load your arc map. Yeah. This is one moment of frustration because it might not work. Second moment of frustration, I will anticipate. It will pop it up, but it won't load the map into the uh, arc map. So fingers crossed, if we see a red explanation mark or some other red symbol on the left side, and I, I agree to this, yes, in this case. All right. This is the worst case scenario. You can see it says base map, red X. So this is one of the streets that doesn't work for us. Okay. We have a solution for all that. So Maria was like, oh, yeah, he knew what's coming. <laughs> yeah, I didn't expect that. <clears throat> all right, let's find a different one. Here, on mine, it's on the sixth tab, there's another streets. Click on it and say open in ArcGIS desktop. Yeah. Oh, I'm here in base maps. I did not select S3 base maps for the second run. So you might actually play here a little bit. This is a process you can repeat and repeat, or we do the shortcut in a moment and you don't have to go back to that. So let's, let's load it and then do the shortcut. Let's see if it opens. Do you open in Arc? Yeah, open up in Arc Desktop. And fingers crossed. Watch the globe. If the globe rotates, data is loading. Perfect. There's a layer on the top, and I have the world in front of me. Everyone sees something like this. Yeah. Right. So to avoid next time to go again to rgsonline.com and find these different maps, save this map. There's this disk sign or file save to your local computer. Right. You gotta click yes on this. Yes. You can you can folder connect to any flash drive below and you have Antarctica. This is not maybe a perfect. Yeah, you can it. Where is you extracted your data, no, you see it. Yeah. Mine is two. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. No, you yeah. did not. Oh, that's right. uh, it's just, uh, it looks like it's just zooming. Yeah, or double click it. Yeah, probably is. Yeah. <laughs> Extract, oh, okay. do this, let it run. All right. <laughs> you need a different map. <laughs> right now, I'm on Antarctica. Five, five, five. 
Uh, you might see different results than us. Oh, so still on Earth, but on a different coin. Dr. Orchard, where do you want us to save it? Uh, on your jump drive or in your downloads. I will demonstrate that as downloads. Okay. All right. So I'm going to do file, save, and that's not where it's supposed to be. Let's do save as. Why don't you give me the desk? Actually, it's just over you guys. Do we save it under save as? It's the easy way. Save as, so you can see down here, save as ArcMap document. And I put it in my download folder. All right? Can we go if we put it in our download folder? Well, I make a copy of my download folder today. All right? I save it. If I go back to my Arc catalog and click refresh on my download folder here on the top, yeah, refresh, right click or F5, my document streets just popped up. If I'm in my downloads folder and I click refresh, like F5, my streets.mxd just popped up as a document. Can you see that? I have my data folder and I have my streets.mxd right now. Or my base map. Okay, anyone on the same page with me? Yeah. No. Refresh. Uh, no. Or right click refresh. So the cool thing now is I don't have to go back with my internet browser and go to rts.com, search for a bunch of maps and open up a failure or not a failure. Next time I want to use this, I close it. Next time I want to use this, I just double click through our catalog and it will pop up again the way I left it last time. Um, I am doing what you said, but it's not, um, it's not showing up. Okay, you have that. In Arc Catalog, you save this, go to Arc Catalog, which is this symbol down there. And go to your downloads folder, more up, and refresh. Refresh at 5 and or refresh. Then you can save the font document. Go back to your map. Save as. Save as. And save it in your download folder. Let's try it. Save. Now go back to our catalog and refresh your downloads. Just do oh, here we go. Hold on. Yeah, I have it. Mine is. Yeah, I have it. Save as. Save as. Save as. Pick the location you want to save. Already there. Yeah, fine. So that's not popping up. Refresh in our catalog. Yeah, but I don't know. Refresh at five. Refresh several times. Yeah, because you're refreshing BCGS data, not downloads. Your folder connection is one or two times. Again, folder connection needs to be download. Disconnect, right click and disconnect. So now hold, click on BGS data and disconnect. All right. I will do this next week for sure more. Let's do a 30 second demo again. Arc catalog. In Arc catalog. If I want to connect to a workspace folder, like a project folder, like in this case right now, downloads. You know? I'm going to connect with the connect plus button here. I'm going to find my username. 
I'm going to simply once click for highlight on downloads. I am not going deeper. If the task is to connect to your project folder called downloads, then downloads is this one down here. You're not going through BCGIS data or something else. You stick to the upper level, downloads. That means it will look like this, and your BCGIS data comes down here. If you don't connect to downloads, and you're trigger finger happy with the mouse clicks, it could end up like this. Downloads, BCGIS data, okay. In this case, you're looking straight into this folder here. See, they are the same. But I'm looking differently on them. If I save something in downloads and I'm looking at BCGIS data, I will not see what's coming over me. Do you want us to do that? Add another one? No. no. Downloads only. Example, we are living in Florida. Everyone goes to the beach. You guys have been snorkeling before. If you go down in the water, on the ground, and your friend is snorkeling over you, you will not see your friend. Yeah? This is what you do right now with the downloads folder. You gotta stick to the surface. Huh? To see to the down to the bottom. Okay, I'm going to disconnect this guy again. This is what we want to see. Alright. So if you keep a copy of this, you basically create, found a base map, and you can use that in your assignment. You don't have to go to ArcGIS.com anymore to find it. Yeah? But we also will look for some uh, topography, some uh, um, area of photography, like you see in Google Maps, all the houses and backyards. We'll do that another time. All right. <clears throat> we open a different arc map. Because right now we're still looking here at meters and something like this. We don't want that. We want our census block group to define our blade round. So I open up a new arc map and I do this with this button here. There are different ways to open it up through the Windows menu down here or shortcut the symbol arc map. Both ways will work the same way. You can have multiple openings of the same application? Oh yeah. It's like you could have 20 different Excel spreadsheets open, like Excel, 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 Excel. We can do this here too. Which helps because you can work with different settings. Huh? So, and I want to just cancel this out because I want to have a blank document. Alright, so this is where we're starting with mapping now. We're going to put our block groups in it, how are we going to add data? Plus sign. Plus sign. Everyone cool with that? Everyone happy how to do this with the plus sign, with this one here? Yeah. Alright, let's add a new way. If you, if you are in our catalog and you're looking at your census blocks here, can you see that? Can you follow? I have ArcMap in the background and I have sense of, uh, uh, our catalog right next to it. I can drag and drop this guy down here. Because you're looking already at your playground, you don't have to find your playground again. You can drag and drop. So two different ways. Use the plus button, that's a safe route. Or do the drag and drop from our catalog into ArcMap. Would you like me to demonstrate this one more time? Yes, yes please. please. All right. Remove. And this is best if you have a large screen. If you have like a small laptop at home, do the plus button. If you have a large screen, like here, you can rearrange this so it's easier side by side. Yeah? So somewhat side by side. This is my arc catalog. I locate my census block. I want to use for this exercise, and I highlight with one click. Then I keep my left mouse button pressed down, and drag and drop, preferable here to layers, sometimes should work here in the data frame as well. Drop it over here, and release 
my left mouse button. And you just saw what happened. Change, color. change colors because it randomly assigns a color of its flavors. Huh? Well, that's fine right now. Oh, yeah. So drag and drop is okay? No, mine's not moving. So depending on your workflow and your arrangement and your happiness, both will work. Here. One click, yeah. And then open it up. Okay. What else do you have? Works for me. Want to try it? Yeah. Click on it. Press it. Click again and hold it. Press down. Press down. Try to press it down. Yeah, yeah, that's what you are. Do you think it down? Click on it. Why you hold it down? Highlight. Highlight. Click. Drag it again. Click on big rocks once. Sensor blocks. No. Press down. Keep it pressed down. Activate. Press down. Check it. If this is not working, before you get too totally frustrated, you use the plus button and find the folder connections. Keep it down and move it. I have no idea why this mouse is on down. Huh? That's the right. Left. You got it. Left. Professor. Finger, finger. Um, right. We can find layers for her here. I mean, we have the title art map. I have layers, but it doesn't have it. Well, she has it connected, so if you would connect to this. Ah, OK, you lost the table of content. Here, window, table of content, or this little fast. And you can actually track this window. Now track it. Oh, yeah, it's on. <laughs> OK. OK. Where's your art map? Uh, 